apostasy. Leaving Islam, this is Book O Justice 8.0, leaving apostasy Islam is the ugliest form of unbelief and the worst. When a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily, apostas voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. In such a case, it is obligatory for the caliph or his representative to ask him to repent and return to Islam. If he does, it is accepted of him, but if he refuses, he is immediately killed. That's where that comes from, Islamic law. And there is no Islamic law that exists that does not say that. Now let me read this again. When a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. Does anybody remember about five years or four years ago when a Muslim convert in uh, Afghanistan converted to Christianity and they were going to kill him and the news media got a hold of it? Anybody remember this? And Hamid Karzai publicly declared him insane. Insane. And our analysts here, the most, you know, the smartest people we got, are like, why did he do that? Because he just saved his life. That's why he did it. Because that's the requirement in Islamic law. You see, I'm not knowing this. Stuff just goes right by us. We, we can spend a lot of time doing these examples, but I just want to make sure you all understand this is real. Now, there's a. Uh, there are, there are so many uh, other pieces to this. How many of you are familiar familiar with um, the, the rules of lying? And I'm, I'm just going to pop it up on the, on the stage here. This is from Book R, and it's called Holding One's Tongue. When it is possible to achieve such an aim by lying, but not by telling the truth, it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible, and obligatory to lie if the goal is obligatory. And if you see the little subheading there, it says permissible lying. That's where that comes from. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out, didn't we just read that jihad is obligatory? Yep. Is the establishment of a caliphate obligatory? Yep. Does it say you are obliged to lie if the goal is obligatory? Well, we hate to think that, but people are lying to us, but they are. Yes, sir. To emphasize that point, Jamal, we were talking with Jamal Badawi at the University of uh, Central Florida. Asked him about the reliance of the traveler, the book you're holding in your hand. And he said that, oh, that's just, you know, that's not Sharia law. That's not what it is. We asked him. Well, you actually signed the book in the front. How can you say that? Right. As a member of the Feet Council, uh, he signed it. Well, because he's lying. Right. Of course. Um, okay. And actually, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at that uh, uh, that clip here momentarily. No, no. What? Yeah, that was something separate than that. Yeah. Okay. Did, yeah. Did you have another point there? Or that, or that was no. It? I'm just saying to, to, to show how the ridiculousness of the, the depths of lying they will go to when the guy who signed the book. That you hold in your hand. We asked him, but he says, "No, we didn't sign it." The, um, the the three things I hear the most is number one, Sharia. It's like the rocks and the moon and the stars and the trees. Okay, and I always just come back and say, "Can you show me where where that where did you get that?" Because I have Islamic legal texts here, and you can get a hundred others, and they all say the same thing. Steve Coughlin arguably the expert in the West on Islamic law, and I, I believe that's true. When he was working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs as the Islamic legal expert, he paid out of his pocket thousands of dollars and went and bought Islamic legal texts and spent several months studying them and realized he got the radical versions. So then he went back and he spent another six, seven thousand dollars and bought more and he realized there's only one version. Because it all says the exact same thing. So when somebody tells you, I, 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 you know, my, I've learned, you know, when these guys come, especially the Muslim brothers, don't get, a, don't get an argument with these guys. You just got to twist their stuff and like back out. When they say there are thousands of versions of, Islam, of you know, Islamic law, you say, okay. Of course, that's not true. You say, okay. Can you show me one version that says what you're saying is true? <laughs> you know what they'll do every time? They'll never hear from them again. Unless they're smashing you through a third party in the media or something. Yes, sir. Uh, the documents that you're showing on screen now, are these from the Reliance of the Traveler? Mm -hmm. And the reason 
that uh, it's the easiest and the one we've recommended to folks, these folks when we do training, is it's like tabletop Islamic law. It's one full book on, on all the key issues. So like, if you're a lawyer, and I'm doing federal whatever law, like Title 18, Title 21 criminal law, I'm, I will have, like as a federal agent, I used to have Title 18 in the one volume, but the U.S. Attorney didn't just have that. He had an entire shelf of Title 18, which had case law and all that other stuff. And this goes to the point of, of how important the law is. Every sentence in the Quran has been defined as what its meaning is legal. So when you hear a Muslim say, hey, you know, what this means to me is, I go, well, that's nice. That's really nice. Do you know if I go into a court and, and say, you know, Your Honor, uh, I think this guy here who just came across the border today, and he's from Country X, I think he's a U.S. person. Um, because, you know, I just feel like he, he's a good guy, and, and you know what the judges say to me, especially if I'm an attorney, he's like, you open your mouth again and you're in contempt. You see, because U.S. federal code has defined what a U.S. person is. Islamic law has defined what every sentence in the Quran means legally. Islamic law says what Islamic law is and what it means. Now, we could spend a long time going through this, but these are key elements that you need to understand are out there. Yes, ma'am. People tend to view the Quran, I guess, as the way we here in our country view the Bible. Um, how much law is actually in the Quran? I've never read it, so I don't know. So. Okay, so her question is, how much law is in the Quran? What is? Let me take a couple minutes and do this, because that's a very good question, and it, it rolls right into what I was going. What I was, I have available to do. If I need to do it, now I'm going to do it. First. Let me say that Islamic law comes from three primary sources. The Quran, which is the uncreated word of God given to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel according to Islamic tradition. Over a period of about 22, 23 years. First in Mecca, then in Medina. Okay? Then you've got the Hadith, or the stories about Muhammad. The stories and sayings about Muhammad, and then you have the sacralized biography. Because the most perfect example of a Muslim is... Muhammad. Muhammad. So if he did it, it was good. It's good for all time. And if you even question that he did something, you can be put to death for that. You say, well, I don't think that was a good idea. Muhammad did that. As a Muslim, you can be put to death for that. So if Muhammad did it, did Muhammad marry a six-year-old? Yes. Yes. Did he consummate the relationship when she was nine? Yes. Yes. If I'm a Muslim male in Egypt, Kuwait, Jordan, and I'm 70... Can I marry an eight-year-old? Yes. Yes. Is there any Islamic scholar in the world that's going to say anything? No. And when one did a couple years ago from, uh, I believe, Egypt, what's the only question they have to say? Are you saying Muhammad is wrong? Whoop, that goes away. That's the end of that discussion. And so you have 70-year-old men, 60-year-old men, 50-year-old men marrying seven, eight-year-olds. Because it's legal. Because Muhammad did it. Did Muhammad in the Battle of the Trench... Was he personally there, or did he personally participate in the cutting off of the heads of Jews? Yes. Of the binding of the hands and feet and the burning of the eyes, yes or no? Yes. So when U.S. soldiers are captured and we find them like that, our soldiers, hands and feet bound, hands cut off, and eyes singed, why do they do that? Because the prophet did it. He's the perfect example. You can't understand this unless you understand that. So... Quran, which is the uncreated word of God, it cannot be ever retranslated, reinterpreted, done. Does the Quran require jihad until the entire world is subordinated to Islamic law? Yes. Yes. Does the Quran say there's no compulsion in religion? Yes. Yes. So how do you balance those? Well, here's how you balance those. Right here. You see, the Quran is not put together chronologically. It's put together in size order. So you have the first surah or chapter is the Bismillah. It's a little introduction. Chapter 2, surah 2, is the largest. It goes from largest, essentially, to smallest. Not by chronological. When the scholars arrange it chronologically, it looks like this. Now, Mohammed started in Mecca. 
the Arabian Peninsula at an approximately 610. He was born approximately 570, 610, and what's he do? He starts, excuse me, getting revelations. What happens is, he's in Mecca. He goes to the Jewish scholars and Christian scholars and say, hey, I'm the new prophet. And what do they say? There's no new prophet. They rebuke him completely. According to Islamic sources, in the first six or so years, he converts about six or seven people to Islam. In the first 13 years in Mecca, he converts approximately 250 people. All the revealed verses during the Meccan period are all no mention of violence or jihad. None. Then he goes to Medina because he's asked to come be a leader up there. He becomes a political leader, a warrior, builds an army, gets allies, and starts converting people. In the Quran, three times it says, whatever is chronologically later overrules anything that came chronologically before that. It's called abrogation. Anything earlier is ab abrogated by whatever comes later. If you understand anything about Islamic law that I've been talking about the last few minutes, this has got to be it. Here's why. Because when you look at these chapters, 2, 3, 8 also, 9 and 5, the last chronological chapter in the Quran to talk about jihad is right there. At the very end. That means it rules. Legally, it rules. It controls. Surah 5, or chapter 5, is the last to talk about relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Let me show you how this works. Because this is good. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Right? But that's abrogated by, but whoever seeks religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him. And obviously, he, he goes to hell. So, only Islam. So, this idea of abrogation or progressive revelation, that stuff was over 23 years revealed to Muhammad. So, the way I, I do this with law enforcement folks, and I can do it here for you. Let's say I want to take uh, Alan out to my car, because in my truck I have a, uh, a big metal pipe, and I want to take Alan out there and beat the crud out of him. You think I'm going to say, hey Alan, I want to go outside and beat the crud out of you? they will be like, sure John. No. Right? But if I say, hey, Alan, I need your help. Could you just come on over here? And he, and he walks over, he's like, sure. And whatever reason I give him to get from there to here, then I say, no. I walk out the door and I say, hey, will you come meet me in the lobby? And I give him a different reason to get him from here to the lobby than what it took him from get to here to here. And if the two contradict each other, it doesn't matter. Because I don't need him to get from there to here. I need to get him from here to there. And then while we're in the lobby, I explain to him, something completely different that contradicts both of those to get him down the hallway out that door. And then eventually I get him to my trunk and I pop the trunk open and he's standing there. You see? And it doesn't matter. All I need to do is get him from one point to the next. That's the idea of the progressive revelation. This process of progressively re revealing this to Muslims is what our law enforcement calls the radicalization process. You're bringing people along from where they are just hanging out to carrying a weapon or blowing themselves up in the jihad. It doesn't just happen overnight. But there's a legal way to do it. And they're bringing the community along. When you meet a Muslim who subscribes to this, adheres to Islamic law, they legitimately may argue with you about what jihad is. Because they have not been taught that jihad is only warfare against non-Muslims. Might be over here somewhere where there isn't even jihad. Literally. When Muslims get converted to it, when, when non Muslims get converted to Islam, all they have to do is say the Shahada, there is no God but God, and Allah is his messenger. And they are not taught about the revolutionary nature of Islam. Because they're not ready for it yet. That comes in progressive stages. Well, this is abrogated by this. Take not the Jews and the Christians for your friends or protectors. They are the friends and protectors of each other. This is the last word in the Quran, which means legally it is what it is. That's it. That's the last word legally on the relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Well, let's take it a little more seriously here. 
Surah 3, whoever seeks a, a religion other than Islam never will, eat, or will never have it accepted of him, is abrogated by fight and slay the unbeliever wherever you find them, and lie and wait for them in every stratagem of war. That's for 